Why has Chinese bike sharing grown so rapidly? Uh, my name is Jeffrey Towson. I'm a professor here at Peking University in, in Beijing, uh, where it is a spectacular day. I'm going to take you outside and show you around in a couple minutes here. Uh, but for those of you who maybe follow my writing, my research, I focus mostly on Chinese consumers, but really the fight for them as much as anything, um, the competition, the dynamics, and I'm, I'm basically trying to see around the corner a little bit, try and predict who's going to win and why. Uh, and within that, I do focus a lot on digital China, on these online companies, O2O, things like that. Uh, in this short video, just a couple minutes, I'm going to basically try and give you my best explanation for bike sharing, Mobike, Ofo. What is going on that they have grown this unbelievably fast in just you know 16 months, 18 months. So with that, I'm going to take you a little bit around Peking University. I'm at the Alibaba Auditorium here at Peking University. This bike sharing phenomenon, and I think it is really a phenomenon. It, the growth is so spectacular and so fast. There's something strange going on here. The story I keep thinking about is one that was told to me by some staff at Mobike, one of the leading bike sharing companies in China. And it was the story of the first day they put their bikes out on the streets. December 7, 2015. Mobike, a very small company back then, they assembled their first 50 bikes. They're in the office. They put the smart locks on, they connect it to the GPS, they connect it to the solar panel, the bikes are ready, they load them on trucks, they drive them downtown, and they just kind of put them on the sidewalk and then they drive away and leave them. And the more I think about it, the more I think that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. What business does that? You know, vending machines, you put those outside, you put them on the sidewalk, but you lock them down and you plug them in. Starbucks has assets outside, uh, tables, chairs. But at the night, at nighttime, you bring them in or you, you lock them down. This idea that you're just going to sort of release your assets out into the world, like you're releasing them into the wild, that's, that's very unusual. That, to me, is the heart of this, the independence of the assets. And, you know, the staff at Mobike, they didn't actually know what was going to happen. There was, like, some discussion, like, what do you think is going to happen? Are these bikes just going to disappear? Are they just going to sit there? And they followed them on GPS, and a couple staff said they even drove by just to look. Are they still even here? And sure enough, out of those first 50 bikes, a couple dozen people downloaded the app. They saw the bike, they downloaded the app, they paid the deposit, and the bike started to move for the first time. So this is unusual, but it's not crazy. It does actually work. Okay, I'm going to take you out on the street now, and we're going to find a couple of these bikes. Okay, we're outside now. It's a little bit out of the sun, which is better. I'm going to go find a Mobike or an Ofo so we can talk about that. That should take like eight seconds, you know, typically. I sometimes think about this, like how pervasive the marketing aspect of these bikes are. Uh, I literally can't go through my day without seeing thousands of them. Uh, I sometimes do count, like how many seconds does it take for me to see another one? And I rarely make it to more than 10 seconds. So, you know, this assets in the wild thing, this idea of lots of assets out in public, it has a powerful marketing effect, especially because they're in places where people live and walk. They're not in stores, they're not on shelves, they're sort of in your life. Okay, so here's a, a Mobike, and this is one of the newest models, I believe. And the thing to think, notice about these is, is from the beginning they were designed to exist on their own. Uh, these bikes, according to Mobike, were supposed to be able to live three to four years without maintenance, without support, out in the world. And so you can see they've incorporated certain things like, I mean, the tires don't have air, they're solid. Uh, there's no chain on these. This is a shaft transmission. Uh, that's the newest sort of smart locks. Um, there's a reinforced kickstand. Uh, that's for durability. And, and the whole thing is made of basically anti-rust aluminum because uh, it's going to be out in the wind and the rain and in Beijing, the snow. Uh, this one doesn't have 
the front basket. Here's an older one. Now the front basket has the solar panel uh, which feeds it so it doesn't need electricity. <laughs> These baskets are also used as a uh, basically kitty seats. Um, they're not supposed to, but pretty much everywhere you go in China you'll see people riding around with, you know, kids and toddlers up in the front. Um, yeah, this is China and that happens. Okay, final point and the uh, the most important, or at least the most fun. Uh, these are independent assets. They can exist on their own. They can sell on their own. They can market on their own. They don't need sales. They don't need support. They don't need anything. And because of that, you can release them in really unlimited numbers. And if you look behind me, you can kind of get a sense for what that means. Let's see if I can pan around here and give you a good shot. But. That is a big reason these bikes are so successful. Their presence in people's daily lives is almost overwhelming. It's like Coca-Cola suddenly put 100,000 vending machines across Beijing, and you had to pass one every five to 10 seconds. That's the cumulative effect of all this. Okay, I'm back in the office. Hopefully that was interesting. Um, this sort of idea of, of independent assets, of which bicycles are probably the first iteration, I think this is really interesting to think about because you can see shades of it in other places, like, like vending machines are getting much smarter and robotics is getting smarter. You're seeing you know drones that move around pretty much on their own. So this idea of like, are our public spaces gonna be sort of filled with these independent assets that just move about on their own and sell on their own? Or maybe not outside, maybe not the public spaces, but what about within universities, within offices, within business parks, uh, within neighborhood? Anyways, that's my take on what's going on. Um, any comments, suggestions, companies to look at, send me an email, leave them in comments. I'd appreciate your thoughts. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Towson uh, from Peking University in Beijing.